Daniel, the sixth chapter. I'm going to be reading the 16th through the 24th verse into your hearing in the Amplified um, Bible. And I want to make sure, so I need you guys to give me a little bit of liberty uh, this afternoon because there are people that really may not be familiar with this biblical story. And even for those of us that might have heard it in Sunday school, we didn't read it. And so I want you to give me the liberty so that we can understand what happens in the wild. Hear the word of the Lord. Then the king gave a command and Daniel was brought and thrown into the den of lions. The king said to Daniel, may your God whom you constantly serve rescue you himself. A stone was brought and laid over the mouth of the den and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signet rings of his nobles so that nothing would be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night fasting. And no music or entertainment was brought before him, and he remained unable to sleep. Then the king arose at dawn, at the break of day, and hurried to the den of lions. When he had come near the den, the Bible says he called out to Daniel with a troubled voice. The king said to Daniel, O oh Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you constantly serve, been able to rescue you from the lions? Then Daniel spoke to the king, O oh king, live forever. My God has sent his angel and has shut the mouths of the lions so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him and also before you, O king. I have committed no crime. Then the king was greatly pleased and ordered that Daniel be taken out of the den. So Daniel was taken out of the den and no injury whatever was found on him because he believed in and relied on and trusted in his God. For a couple of moments this afternoon, I want to talk from this start. Starving the hunt. That's what I want to talk from. Starving the hunt. You can have your seat in the presence of the Lord. Father, I'm asking that you would make alive a story in the Bible that we have heard about, but we haven't fully examined. Father, I thank you for the fact that you're able to starve things that hunt us as food. Father, I give you praise that even when we're in dangerous situations, for some reason, it's like we're not only fireproof, but we're lion proof. And so God, I'm asking that you would revelate in this place. And I ask that you show us why we should never be afraid of another thing, another day in our lives. In Jesus name, somebody say amen. Just turn to your neighbor and say, God is going to starve the hunt. Tell your other neighbor, God's going to starve the hunt. He's not going to stop the hunt. He's going to starve the hunt. He's not going to stop it, but he will starve it. Lions, lions, uh, lions are fearless African predators. They're from Africa, all of them, that have always been referred to as the king of nature. Lions are often seen as one of the most dangerous animals on the planet, and they are particularly aggressive and dangerous to humans, Mook, because humans are so rare in their natural habitat as a food option that when given the opportunity to devour a human, a lion will begin to devour the human without even killing the human first. And there are many other 
species and entities and seasons that are designed with innate nature to devour. This animalistic nature doesn't have an internal stop. It doesn't have an internal pause. It doesn't have an internal reasoning. It doesn't have an internal selectiveness. There are just simply species and entities and season whose hunger to devour you and I cannot be stopped or can it? For here it is in the sixth chapter of the prophetic book of Daniel that we find the story of Daniel, a prophet, being placed in a den of lions. It is the lions that we would assume were starving for a hunt. But if you exegete the totality of the chapter you'll find that the lions weren't the first beasts that were trying to devour Daniel. Because the truth is, uh, jealous humans can be more hungry than a lion. Can I show you the first predators in this biblical story? Uh, to do that, we will have to back up to the first verses of Daniel chapter 6. I asked for permission to do this before I started. Let me read it to you in the message translation for those unfamiliar with the story because you think that only lions are predators. The Bible says, Daniel the 6th chapter, we're going the first verse through the 12th, Darius reorganized his kingdom. Yeah. He appointed, watch this foolery, 120 governors to administer all the parts of his realm. Uh, Trinell, over them were three vice regents, one of whom was Daniel. Three, three men, the big wigs, they're in charge. And they made sure that everything was in order for the king. The Bible says, but Daniel, brimming with spirit and intelligence, so completely outclassed the other vice regents and the governors that the king decided to put Daniel in charge of the whole kingdom. We went from three and now it's just one. The vice regents and governors then got together to find some old scandal or skeleton in Daniel's life that they could use against him, but they couldn't dig up anything, Kalana. He was totally exemplary and totally trustworthy. They could find no evidence, Dushana, of negligence or misconduct. Let's keep reading. So they finally gave up and said, we're never going to find anything against this Daniel unless we can cook up something religious. This isn't a biblical story. This is happening to you and you don't even know it. The vice read, the vice read, oh, yeah, I can't wait till we start preaching about demons. The vice regents and governors conspired together and then went to the king. And this is what they said, King Darius, live forever. We've convened your vice regents, governors, and all your leading officials. Everybody else had a team meeting and have agreed that the king should issue the following decree. For the next 30 days, no one is to pray to any god or mortal except you, O king. Anyone who disobeys will be thrown into the lion's den. Issue this decree, O king, and make it unconditional as if written in stone like all the laws of the Medes and the Persians. And King Darius, dummy, signed the decree. When Daniel learned that the decree had been signed and posted, the decree 
that no one is to pray to any God or mortal except the king. Y'all want to know what Daniel did? He, he, he continued to pray. Just recite as he had always done. His house had windows in the upstairs that opened toward Jerusalem three times a day. Daniel knelt there in prayer like he always had, thanking and praising his God like he always had. The conspirators came and found him praying, asking God for help. They went straight to the king and reminded him of the royal decree that he had signed. Did you not, they say? Sign a decree forbidding anyone to pray to any God or man except you for the next 30 days. And anyone caught doing it would be thrown into the lion's den. Absolutely, said the king, written in stone like all the laws of the Medes and the Persians. Then they said, Daniel, one of the Jewish exiles, ignores you, O king, and defies your decree. Three times a day, he prays. At this, the king was very upset and tried his best, watch the text, to get Daniel out of the fix. He put him in. He worked at it the whole day long. But then the conspirators were back lions. Remember, O oh king, it's the law of the Medes and Persians that the king's decree can never be changed, which lands us in our pericope. Verse 16 says, then the king caved in. And what, what's he going to do? And ordered for Daniel to be brought and thrown into the lion's den. Family, sometimes the truth is danger can be a prerequisite for a miracle. Someone could ask a very critical question at this juncture of the text. God, why didn't you save Daniel from this order? Why did you allow the king to be manipulated to create the order? There are people that have faith for God to block it. Then there are people that have faith to believe God to stop it. Then they have people that have faith for God to bring you out of it. But do we notice that we never look for nor ask God to shift something in it? But I came with an announcement of sobriety that most miracles are going to demand that you be sentenced to it. Our text says that there's nothing else that can be done. Daniel has been ordered to be placed into an environment that guarantees his death. But what I love is what happens in the next verse. The king said to Daniel, may your God. I wish I could preach it. I don't have time. Who you constantly serve. Rescue you himself, which is what makes it a wonder, not a miracle or a sign. Remember that this is the king that saw Daniel's excellent spirit. And his unmatched intelligence and his unparalleled class. Remember that this is the king that was manipulated by jealous lion, I mean vice regents, into enacting a law that has now caused the king to have to act in a manner that he doesn't desire. Remember that this is the king that therefore stayed up all night long trying to find a way to free Daniel from the edict that he put in place. But this is the same king who now has been impacted and interest peaked regarding a God that he has watched Daniel obey, but he does not know. So this king that doesn't worship God, hey, has found himself in a predicament in which his only other option of relief of his own guilt is the existence of a God he doesn't believe. That's why you're in danger. Here it go. May your God, whom you constantly serve, 
rescue you himself. The truth is God will often allow you to get right to the point of being injured if it will mean turning on someone's interest. This king felt so bad about what was about to happen to Daniel by his actual hands, but by the puppeteering of lions, that he now needed Daniel's God to be real. And we still haven't heard one word from Daniel yet. So watch the text, a stone, the Bible says was brought and laid over the mouth of the den and the king sealed it with his own signet ring, the signet rings of all the nobles so that nothing would be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night fasting he said, don't bring me no music. I don't, want, don't bring, I don't want no belly dance. Don't bring nobody in here. And I stopped by, I stopped by to let someone know as we prepare to go on sabbatical that God has a way to turn the one who was the initiator of your danger to become your intercessor out of danger. They're trying to find a way to remove the guilt that they feel because their hands is what got you in this predicament. They didn't mean to put you in the predicament, but because they weren't an accurate leader. Wait a minute. So, is the issue the jealous regents? Or is the issue an unwise leader? I'm just wondering, who's responsible for him being in the den? The lions or the leader? I just want to know. You better find you a leader. That knows what is a grievance and what is a trap. You better find you a leader that can listen to the other people on your team complain about you and know that something don't sound right, Janine. You better find you a leader that knows how to tame lions. You better get you a leader. Chris and I are lion tamers. We can spot what it is that you're trying to do. And there will be no one uh, that will force us to do a decree because of your jealousy. Wow. We won't shift a ministry because of your jealousy. Somebody else won't get licensed so you, so because of your jealousy. So was it the lion Whew. or was it the leap? And that's not even my point. Let's get back to God's point. The Bible says the king arose at dawn at the break of day. Watch the story. Hurries. Why? Why, king, are you headed to the den? To mourn? He came near the den and then called out to Daniel with a troubled voice. He said, I'm not sure, but maybe he's God. Yeah. The king said, uh, oh, Daniel, <laughs> servant of the living God. Deandra, Deandra, I don't have time to make it and preach it. The king who doesn't believe in God is now announcing and giving reference to God. Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you constantly serve, been able to rescue you from family? Daniel has been in a situation of guaranteed, it's been 24 hours or so. He's been in a den of lions with no way out. But for some reason, the king chose not to approach the den in grief not to approach the den in sackcloth and ashes, 
not to approach the den with people to help him pull any leftover fragments of Daniel's body that could be salvaged at the bottom of the lion, a den, a for burial. No, the king didn't approach the den of disaster looking for body parts. He came looking to hear a voice. And I need someone to remember my voice in the next upcoming months uh, because God is going to challenge whether you believe that he can perform wonders without human intervention or not. He's listened to me. He's going to test you not before the destruction, but after the destruction. To see if you believe that we're not just fireproof, but we're also hunger proof. Y'all, guess what I found out? Watch, watch this. Listen to me. Uh, lions have an instinctive ability to sense the hunger of another species. I feel like preaching. Let me say it again. Lions, Laura, I'm shifting had the instinctive ability to sense the hunger and starvation inside of another species. And if a species is sensed to be hungry, the lion is quicker to devour that species. Why? Because lions know that what they do when they're hungry is what somebody else could do when they're hungry. So they are clear that if you're hungry, maybe you're going to try to eat me too. But if you spent any time at all hanging out in the book of Daniel, you'll know that Daniel was a very disciplined prophet, especially when it came to his diet. Daniel uh, wasn't easily enticed by food. <laughs> and he wasn't easily enticed by culture. <laughs> so much so that Daniel, in just five previous chapters, had requested that him and his homeboys be able to eat a restricted diet that would seem like not a lot to others, but it was just enough for them. When your focus is on walking out the will of the Father, natural hunger doesn't rule your life. I've got Bible proof, John, the fourth chapter. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus to have a meal, saying, Rabbi, teacher, you need to eat. But he told them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Duh, has anyone brought him some? Who, who brought Jesus? Who brought Jesus some? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to completely finish his work. But as good as that revelation is, Daniel was still there way too long for any lion to not take advantage of a trap meal. Yeah. So we would need more for it to be a wonder. And our text gives us just that. The king came looking for a voice and lo and behold, the Bible says that Daniel spoke to the king. Oh, king, live forever. <laughs> My God has sent his angel and has shut the mouths of the lions so that they have not hurt me. Now, angels don't have bodies. They're disembodied spirits. But that's how you know that this was a supernatural wonder. Watch it because one angel shut the mouths of multiple and I dispatched just one angel to begin to shut the mouths of every person that has been seeing you as solely something to devour. I came on this last Sunday before we go on sabbatical to dispense by the Holy Ghost at this very moment. Angels that will be able to come and what they're going to do for you in the month of July is shut their mouth every person that has been speaking against you every person that has been lying about you every person that has been doing rumors about your past I'm trying to let you know they're going to choke on their own spit 
God says, this is, oh, when he told me, I almost backflipped. He said, I'm giving you a silent summer. To shame. For all of you all and your friend, you know what they're saying. God says for this summer, I'm, I'm going to make them shut their mouth. Every single thing that they have had to say about you and you have held your peace. God says, I'm sending an angel to shut their mouth. I declare that they won't be able to devour you with their tongue. I declare that they won't be able to curse you with their tongue. I declare that they won't be able to misquote you with their tongue. I declare that they won't be able to lie on you with their tongue. I declare that they won't be able to gossip about you with their tongue. I declare uh, that they won't be able to change the story uh, with their tongue. I declare they won't even be able to utter your name. Somebody declare, God, shut their mouth. Say it one more time. God, shut their mouth. Say it one more time. God, shut their mouth. And why is God going to shut their mouth? It's right in the text. It's verse 22. The B clause. Because I was found innocent. What does that mean? Because I shut mine. Wait a minute. Elder Christie. Be Corey Bell. Because I shut mine, he's going to shut yours. Because I chose to voluntarily muzzle my own mouth, yours is about to be because uh, I was found innocent before him and you, king. I have done nothing to warrant what I have just been through in this past season. I want to talk to people who've committed no crime today. I want to talk this afternoon to the people who have done absolutely nothing to harm another person. I want to talk this afternoon to the people in here whose hands are clean. The people whose speech is clean. I want to talk to the people who simply didn't do it. God told me to tell you, you may be surrounded by lions, but they'll never get a taste of you. Don't get weary in well-doing uh, because your clean hands is what's going to authorize the shutting of their dirty mouths. The text says, then the king was greatly the king, I mean, pleased. And he ordered, now you want to order, you, you need to order some because you like ordering up decree. He ordered Daniel be taken out of the den. So Daniel was taken out of the den. No injury, whatever was found on him because of what? And? And? Why was there no injury? Because he what? And? And? One more time. Why was he not injured? Because what? And? And? Do you do the same? It was his belief that made him not look hungry. <laughs> it was his reliance that made him not look thirsty. Wait a minute. It was his trust in his God that made the lions think that he was no harm and the angels still shut their mouth. God says, I'm done in this next season. I'm not keeping you away from lions. I'm just going to supernaturally starve their hunger. God told me to let somebody a no, listen to God, I want you in their space and they not be able to do 
what they do with you. Let me say that one more time. <laughs> ah, ah, ah. Some of y'all's prayer, DeAndre's losing it. Some of y'all prayers is, Lord, change their heart, God. Lord, save them, God. I'm not, it was, that's, that's good. I don't, I'm done, I'm done with it. I don't, I'm sorry. I'm not an evangelist anyway. I don't have an evangelistic anointing. I don't have that. Darnisha is an evangelist. She wants everybody to get saved. I'm trying to not be eaten. <laughs> Nellie, when I was studying this week, I said, God, I just want to make sure, is you saying that I can let this go and the only thing I need to pray for now is an angel? That whether you want to believe in my God or not, yeah. Darnisha will take care of that. Yeah. <laughs> Why are y'all laughing? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to teach on it next month. Oh, no, I'm not. That was a lie. Okay. Okay. That was a lie, and I repent. Yeah. I'm not preaching about that next month, yeah. but in August. Yeah. I'm going to preach about how you're being devoured because you're moving and tipping into an office you don't belong in. And I just crushed some of you all that was just like, ooh, the pastor's saying she's not going to evangelize. Like, That's what I'm saying. That's not my office. And are you being devoured because while you're tipping over into hers, you're not guarding your what's happening? What's, what's happening? Hence why you did not recognize that it was a trap. What the, what the governor's... See how that works, Carter? If you'd mind your own office, Somebody needs to post that. And let me tell you how God's trying to train us to do that, Tamika. July. Do nothing. <laughs> Don't do anything. I can hold your life while you're at the beach. You're not going to lose a thing. I can hold your friendships. I can hold your, I can hold all, because this is the thing. I'm sorry. I've been holding. <laughs> you ain't held nothing. You ain't never held nothing. Here you go. Per my last email, you ain't holding nothing. Your job been trying to fire you. The Lord has been keeping you in that job. <laughs> per my last email, I don't work with anybody that per my last emails. I'm not retarded. I don't need you to direct me to the last email. I read it. You're being smart. And I don't like smart talking, sassy talking people because it's pride. And go. Per your last won't work for me. Per your last email means you didn't see what I, you didn't, you're not hearing what I'm saying. So, uh, huh, 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 over there. Hmm. Let them, huh, over there. But over here we do humility. Also we do fun very much fun. We must laugh in this meeting because this meeting is my life. And your destiny is not a destination. Your destiny is happening right now. And so if you don't guard the joy in your own destiny, you're never going to get to the joy that you think that you're going to get to when you get there. But there is no there. You are the there. So, uh, God is about to send angelic assistance to starve everything that has been attempting to hunt you 
simply because you're brimming with spirit and intelligence and you so completely outclass the rest. God is sending relief to his best, not by getting you out of it, but by controlling the devourers when you're in it. I'm done now. Am I the only one who is wondering what happened to the real lions? What happened to the ones in which the hunger for power, the hunger for position, fueled this attempt to devour a prophet? You want to know what happened? I left it out. The king then gave a command. And those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and thrown into the den of lions. Sharif. Not just them. And I'm, I'm not ashamed about the joy that flooded your kids. Put them in there too. And your wives. Put the whole, fa put the whole family and before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. People are going to be devoured on the way into what you sat in. I guess those men, their children and their wives must have been full. Full of pride. Paris, full of arrogance full of lust, full of envy. The people who have spoken against you, God is about to ensure that the trap they set for you will devour them before they even reach the bottom. Ask the Hebrew boys in the furnace. I talked about it last. If you don't want to do that, you can ask Mordecai in the book of Esther. If you don't want to do that, you can ask Jesus. Because once he left the tomb, went into hell, took the keys, and then presented himself to his disciples, they were all wondering what happened because the other two hanging there died. This is the year of beyond. This year, we're going beyond every demonically fueled trap. We're going beyond every demonically fueled snare. We're going beyond every demonically fueled plot. And this year, we're going beyond every demonically fueled lie. But don't you ever flinch another day around a hungry lion. And in the fall, <laughs> I'm going to teach you what you need to know to ensure that you don't flinch. I will make sure that you're able to see spirits before you see a person. And so I want to invite you to come hang out with True City in the fall because we talked about angels, we talked about miracles, we talked about signs, we talked about wonders. But now I want to talk about the lioness roar of people who open up themselves to unclean spirits. I don't want you flinching around lions. And I also don't want you proclaiming ungodly decrees. When this year is over, you all are going to be some dangerous Holy Ghost sharpshooters. Nothing is going to be able to get past you. And things will be free because of you. You will have the ability to see beyond what you can see. And so enjoy this summer of silence because when we get back, I'm going to teach you how to decode every screen. Everyone standing on your feet. Hey, glory to his name. <laughs> Let's pray. Every eye closed. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for all of those whose brilliance, power, radiance and class attracts the evil within mankind for every trap that was laid for them simply because they were ascending higher than others being promoted faster than others or simply 
being favored by someone in a position of authority. I'm asking God that you would comfort the intelligent. Hmm. That you would comfort the classy and help them to know that every deceitful plot will end in kings believing in you and the jealous regretting that they ever chose to attempt to diminish or hurt you. God, today I'm asking for you to comfort the innocent, for you to encourage the innocent. There are some that had a part in things, and then there are others that had a part of nothing but you being glorified. For them, God, we thank you for a silent summer. And I thank you, God, that you are going to make accurate every single skewed record. I thank you, Father, that whether it be family, whether it be friend, whether it be supervisor, whether it be colleague, whoever it is, God, I thank you that apologies are coming to us this summer. But I give you praise, God, that the apology is not actually ultimately what we're after. What we're after is the ability to trust in, rely on, and believe in your power to keep us. And the reality that in actuality, if a king shifts over to you, God, then that means that the whole nation has to follow. And so, Father, we thank you for every miracle that you have and will perform in our lives. We thank you, God, for every sign that you have and will give us of confirmation. And we most certainly bow in holy reverence and awe to every time that you you save us without human hands. You are a wonder. And so we thank you for the ride that we've taken the first half of this year. But we're very excited with anticipation about what you're going to teach us about other disembodied spirits. But we thank you that after this sermon today, the spirit of fear will no longer exist in our body. And therefore, we will be able to see God without trepidation. And so, Father, I thank you now for every single partner of True City. I thank you, God, as they enter into your rest. I thank you, God, as they enter into a Selah. I thank you, God, as they enter into a holy pause. I thank you, God, that you will free them from any and all anxiety, but that you would allow them the ability to breathe and rest relax and enjoy. Why? Because you're holding their life in your hands. And so, Father, we break now. We retreat now. We surrender now. Everything, including ourselves, into your hands. And we thank you for the ability to breathe without thought, without question, without worry that we're going to lose something. We thank you for freedom and the ability to trust you in deeper ways. And so bless your people, God. Every person underneath the banner of this church, keep them safe and keep them covered. As they travel, keep them safe and keep them covered until we come back again. If it be your will, you are a wonder. In Jesus' name, somebody say amen.